Hello, today we're gonna to take a little time to talk about some very important safety tips and procedures when working at the University of San Diego's biochemistry and chemistry labs, particularly focusing on the biochemistry and molecular biology safety. This training is to be used in addition to the basic training you've already had. This might be required for students doing research in biochemistry, biochemistry related labs, and it may be used for some of your classes. I will talk about specific highlights and important concepts and safety issues throughout these slides. After, done watch, after you're done watching this video, there will be a multiple choice quiz, which you may take. To do that, you'll be given a PDF of all the slides you're about to see. You'll get more information on these slides than I'll talk about today. So you'll be able to open up the PDFs, look at the slides while taking your test. The important part is to understand and review these safety training issues so that way your time while working at USD is safe and productive. <clears throat> so let's talk about the things you've already seen before in, let's say, a general chemistry or organic chemistry lab, acids and bases. As always, make sure you wear full PPE when using acids and bases. Watch out for splashing, and especially when you're using the pH meter, wear your goggles, wear gloves, wear lab coats. Acids and bases need to be stored in separate containers um, in underneath each hood in the biochemistry labs, as well as the biochemistry research spaces. We have corrosive and bases. These are stored in two separate locations underneath the fume hoods in each of our spaces and in the biochemistry lab. Flammables need to have their own storage space and they should not be mixed. Small amounts of acids and bases can be saved in the appropriate smaller containers typically within a containing uh, tub or something on the bench top, but large, large volumes uh, need to be stored underneath the hoods in the acids or bases, corrosives, as well as the flammables. A couple of the uh, common acids and bases we use that we run into in biochemistry and molecular biology, nitric acid, this is a strong oxidizing acid. Uh, it can be all sorts of problems if you mix it with things like uh, acetic acid, um, because of the oxidation neutralization things that happen on there, you can get all sorts of problems as you work with nitric acid. Um, older nitric acid bottles will have corroded or, or beat up red caps. So you can't just grab a nitric acid bottle without carefully taking a look and making sure that the cap is okay. Uh, nitric acid that is yellow over time, that means there's been a reaction with the oxygen to get rid of some of the nitrogen dioxide exposed to light, and that's no good. Glacial acetic acid, Dilute acetic acid is simply vinegar, but at uh, higher concentrations, the highest concentration is called glacial acetic acid. It can cause a significant um, uh, acid burn um, damage to your tissue. It's also a flammable liquid when it's that high. You want to make sure you use this in the fume hood because the uh, fumes from working with and pouring uh, glacial acetic acid is just uh, as damaging uh, as you inhale it as if it were HCl or something. Always remember certain tips, never add acid to water, never add water to concentrated acid that can generate um, um, lots of heat, could break the container, create acidic steam, um, stir when you mix, add the solutions. Uh, and once it's cooled, then you can close things off and put it in the proper container. If you're adding and mixing and diluting out acids, um, you end up generating heat, you cap that thing off as the, as the bottle cools down, it'll create a vacuum and it'll be very hard to remove that tip or that that uh, bottle closure and you'll end up cracking the glass or plastic if you're not careful. So here's an example where you can see the flammables underneath uh, one of the fume hoods in one of the biochemistry um, research spaces and corrosives where you get acids and bases separate. Um, inside the hood, you can see here's the place where we got flammables for collecting for hazardous waste inside a tub. You may see these same things in on top of the benches, but again, smaller volumes in a safety collected um, tub. Cryogens. We often will need to use liquid nitrogen or dry ice in our experiments. And sometimes outside of the fact that it's cold to the fingers, uh, we overlook the potential hazard when working with cryogens. Uh, one of the big things, if you're not careful, is asphyxiation. The obvious danger is, of course, um, pouring liquid nitrogen or, or holding dry ice for too long where you start causing frostbite to expose skin. Um, you want to make sure you wear a 
full phage seal, when you, especially when you're working with liquid nitrogen, long, uh, long um, sleeves or a lab coat minimum, um, and make sure you're wearing thermal insulated gloves. Don't, you know, handle these things without protective um, thermal insulation for your hands. So there's two ways we use liquid nitrogen. We can store it long-term in these insulated containers called doers. And of course, liquid nitrogen is stored in the research, in the, in the department as high, uh, liquid nitrogen, which you will run out or run out. Whenever you need to get liquid nitrogen from the large silver container, make sure you're well-trained from your PI or your instructor on how to safely remove this and avoid the dangers of pouring it on your hand, onto the floor, uh, your foot, or even getting too much exposure and then asphyxiation, which is the main hazard. Oxygen deficiency is can sneak up on you if you're sitting in a small room where you got liquid nitrogen constantly boiling off. You get a displacement of the oxygen levels by a higher concentration of the nitrogen. It doesn't take long before you start getting dizzy and it can sneak up on you. So you want to make sure if you're using liquid nitrogen in more than just small, you know, um, 500 mil volumes, uh, especially pouring out large volumes that you're in an area where there's lots of air exchange, not a small room, not in your lab by yourself, make sure there's somebody that's around to keep a track of you when you're working on this. Uh, it doesn't take very long to have that in your face and, and cause asphyxiation. Um, of course, People are aware dry ice and cryogens, liquid nitrogen can cause all sorts of problems to the human tissue. Um, do not touch these things directly, especially the liquid nitrogen. I know there's all sorts of videos of people using um, liquid nitrogen and holding it in their hand and watching the gases keep the liquid above the hand and creating like an insulating layer with the gases. Um, that's called the Lidenfrost effect. Um, where the liquid nitrogen is um, directly contacting skin form an insulating uh, vapor layer. Uh, and it looks cool on a video, but it's absolutely dangerous because it doesn't take long for that, that gas layer to dis dissipate and the liquid nitrogen to ruin that. There are actually videos of people who put liquid nitrogen in their mouth, taking advantage of the leading frost effect and then pouring, trying to get it back out. But there are several cases of somebody having a gag reflex and swallowing it into their body and causing frostbite and tissue death uh, in their esophagus and even into their lungs. So no, no liquid nitrogen challenges. Autoclave, you're gonna run into using an autoclave, whether it's to prepare sterile solutions or to get rid of bacteria or other cell, other hazardous waste <clears throat> that needs to be sterilized before we can get rid of it. Uh, the basic principles of autoclave operation are using high temperature and heat. That's that high heat, especially the humid steam heat, can then penetrate all the areas within the autoclave um, and then killing any microbes, any um, life that you want to try to get rid of or sterilize. Uh, this moist heat, especially steam heat, uh, creates better contact and gets rid of the microorganisms, can actually coagulate the proteins as they denature. Um, there's two types of settings when you use an autoclave. We have gravity and vacuum or gravity assisted. We'll talk about that in a second. Here you can see a picture of one of the two uh, autoclaves we have here at USD. The controller here, readouts here. Make sure you're trained and signed off on this using talking to your you know, PI or your lab instructor and be very careful and do not bang on these. Um, talk to your PI about the proper use of these handles. These handles can break if they're banged on to close or open them. So autoclaving really is just generating high steam in a or heat and pressure in a in a in a closed sealed container. It's a great big pressure cooker, is what it is. And how you release this pressure with the steam slowly or through gravity, very very quickly, uh, can change what happens inside the the liquids in an autoclave. So as you know, when the pressure builds up, you're going to get gases become liquid. When you release that pressure, those saturated gases will come out of solution, basically boiling off and spilling over things. You, know, you can lose your sample by doing that. You can cause a great mess in, the, in autoclave. So making sure that you release the gas appropriately slowly for liquids 
and it can be quickly uh, for solids is an important part of autoclave safety. There are three phases to your basic autoclave. There's the purge phase. And um, that's the case where you're getting rid of the air, where we're replacing it with the steam, the sterilization phase. When the temperature and pressure comes up to the point that you set the instrument at, and the longer it stays, the more um, you can get sterilization. And then the exhaust phase, that's when we're talking about, are we doing gravity? Are we doing gravity assist? How fast is the air removing um, from the autoclave chamber? Two important factors when doing autoclaving, time, and temperature. High temperatures for a short period of time or moderate temperatures for longer period of times will effectively give the same thing, a sterilization killing the microbes inside. Um, using high pressure, you can get a higher steam for a shorter period or a higher temperature for a, a short period of time, uh, allows this not to take a long period of time. You can see here that as you um, change the temperature, you have a lower need for time. So a high temperature, like 285 degrees Fahrenheit, you only need um, a fraction of a minute to effectively kill most of the microbes in a solution. Whereas at 176, it could take many, many hours to kill these microbes. So it's time versus temperature. And we use steam to increase the contact of the heat and the high pressure to get the temperature higher. Um, so because it takes longer time for different volumes of solutions inside an autoclave to get to that killing temperature, if you will, the larger the volume you have inside that autoclave, the longer time you need to leave the solution in there. This table we show here is just a very simple idea where every, if at the same temperature, and increasing volumes of a solution, how long should they be sitting for? These are individual bottles or containers, not all of the solution inside the incubator because we're talking the average time it takes the heat to um, transfer throughout a single container. And you know, a small 75 mil uh, bottle, 25 minutes, half an hour, two liters or more, about an hour time. So if you look at this, sign here, we have three basic settings already programmed into our autoclave. We have the gravity, and that's the quick release where it basically opens up um, the valve on the bottom part of the autoclave and the gas comes, or the high pressure steam comes ripping out, right? And then you that's set at 250 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. We'll cover all of your solids. So if you've got solids or plastics, things that you, uh, bottles that, that dry that you wanna uh, sterilize, this is the setting for you. And then we have two liquid settings at 45 and 30 minutes, kind of looking at these times. So 45 minutes is about a liter, 30 minutes is the smaller, up to about a hundred or so mil bottles, or 250 mil bottles will be just fine. And again, these are liquid exhaust, meaning it's a, low exhaust so that way you don't watch all the gases inside your liquid come out quickly and spill over losing your solutions which you prepared in autoclave and also causing a mess at the bottom of the autoclave each autoclave sometimes will change you can see here's a snapshot i took of the controller um, right now we've got gravity one and gravity two if you if you learn how to scroll through this you can see how to change the time but again if you've got <clears throat> if you've got 500 mils or so uh, 200 mils, 100 mils, 50 mil bottles, 30 minutes is going to be good. If you're doing a liter, liter and a half, two liters, you're going to want to make sure that your time is up there and you're on the liquid setting. It says right here, a really important point to remember, you can mix solids and liquids on the liquid cycle. That's the slow exhaust. Solids don't matter how long it takes for the get in there. It's a convenience if you have only solids to go through the, the faster gravity cycle. Right, But if you've got liquids at all, whether it's liquids by themselves or liquids mixed with solids, you have to take the slower liquid exhaust, which means it takes longer for the cycle to complete, or wait for everything to come to a final temperature or a pressure before you can get at your samples. One last thing it shows here in, in red pink, don't leave your materials past completion. If you're trying to create um, luria broth or PBS, what you're gonna do is too much heat for a long period of time, and start caramelizing um, and, and um, basically overcooking 
the sugars and the proteins in those medias. If you're doing something like PBS, which is salts and phosphate um, solutions, um, you're going to end up causing too much steam loss, heat loss, and your concentrated liquid is no longer going to be at the, the final concentration you had hoped for if you leave those in for multiple hours or or even overnight. It might not be convenient to have to stick around, but you can't throw your LB or your agar or things like that in there and leave them overnight. And quite honestly, it's not polite to the other folks who want to use this stuff if you leave it for long periods of time. So adjust your time, work with your PI, work with your partners in your lab to make sure you take things out right away. If you do come to your autoclave and some stuff in there, pressure's down, you open it up, Take care to put it to the side, use the cart, use all the care you need to use gloves, PPE, and then put your stuff in. Um, again, PPE is important, lab coat, use the heat resistant gloves. Um, don't use any other gloves, there's lots of gloves. If you can't find them, that means they've been borrowed and not returned. Return the gloves when you're done and wear eye protection, especially when unloading the hot autoclave. Never seal your containers, make sure your containers are loose I like to tell my students, you put the, the cover on or the cap on a bottle and you turn it just enough where you can you can lift it up and no more. You want it plenty lift so that, or plenty loose so that as the gases expand when it heats and then contracts when it cools down, it doesn't suck that cap on there tight and cause an implosion or, or even an explosion if you have it tight to start with, right? Never open the door if there's running water. If there's a problem, contact your PI. Look at Keith McDonald, the building safety person. Um, and you've got to wait till the pressure reaches zero um, and then opening the door. If, if the door has got pressure on it, it won't open. If it doesn't open easily, don't bang on that control or that, that the, um, um, the opening mechanism. Get some help. When you do open it, you open it just a crack and stand away. Let the steam go up. We have contain, uh, we have built in um, exhaust systems to take care of that. Wait for the cycle to finish off that steam to come out before you reach in there. Be careful when you're reaching into the autoclave. You can burn the sides of your arms. And if you're dealing with liquids and they're not on a cart and you're picking them up individually, do not move them fast. If they're still really hot and they've you know, got lots of gas and maybe still ready to come out, if you bump them or knock them, that can, that can start all those gases to come out of solution. It'll basically boil over and then burn you, boil you, all right? A lot of people like to carry stuff against their chest or their body because it's easier to hold them. Never do that. This is a bad habit to get into. You don't want to take and contaminate your body contaminants on your materials. And it's certainly a bad habit to take whatever it is in your buckets or your containers, your bottles onto your body. So hold them away from yourself and just put them on a cart right away, right next to you. Do not autoclave sharps. We have sharp containers in each lab, the red buckets you learn about in the general uh, basic safety. Hazardous materials that would be, that were that were flammable, reactive, corrosive, do not um, autoclave those things. Um, the gap, the off gas, they potentially explode, they could cause reactions and ruin things, especially bleach or bleach associated materials. Um, if you do work with radioactive materials, you do not autoclave radioactive materials because you don't want those gases getting around and contaminating all of the area. Pathological waste, uh, if this happens to be what you're doing, we're not talking about bacteria or cell culture waste. We're talking about tissues like human tissues or animal carcasses. We do not autoclave those. There's all sorts of policies and training specifically for pathological waste and working with animals. Big problem you can see here is Plastics sometimes melt, right? Or under heat and pressure, they'll the capsules suck on, it cools down and creates a vacuum, and then they'll implode like you see here in the upper left. Uh, wrong plastic will cause a melt. You can see these plastics literally melted onto the base floor of the autoclave and is same case in here. So you have to make sure you're using the right kind of plastic. If you don't know, ask. If you don't know, ask your PI. It does not hurt to ask a bunch of times because you do not want to see this happening because it can ruin the entire autoclave or you're going to have to be in there scraping this thing away yourself. So what are safe polypropylene um, and polypropylene copolymers, PP and PPCO? Um, there's certain fluoropolymers that can be autoclaved without problems, um, PFA, FEPs. 
Um, you can look at the bottles and you can see if they're polypropylene, they'll have the right uh, indicators. Some, you can do polycarbonate containers. Uh, those are clear rigid, but especially if they've got alkali in them or steam additives, they can only handle a few autoclaving cycles before they start getting really, um, they risk at either off-gassing or actually shattering and fracturing. Um, they do have a bit of a lower melting point, so they can handle a couple of autoclaves, but it's still not good to use polycarbonate because it doesn't take too many times for that low melting point and repeated autoclaving causes a failure. Um, um, nylon, acrylic, um, PVC, PS, these softer plastics like you see here do not get autoclaved. Um, buckets are not all for autoclaving. So you got to make sure that especially the polypropylene, probably uh, PFA um, or PPCO. So pay attention to that. Glass can certainly be autoclaved, but again, make sure that cap is loose. So that way, if it's tight, as the gases expand with the heat, we don't get an explosion or you don't get um, a vacuum causing the, the seal, to, uh, the, the, the cap to get too tight. Um, so when dealing with things, you want to keep things separate. Notice here we have liquids inside a container. That's perfect. You want to make sure you use the autoclave tape. Um, before sterilization, we have little stripes that turn black after they've been treated with enough heat at a high enough temperature. Uh, up here, you can see uh, the red bag for hazardous waste materials. You put them, your materials, let's say cell culture material or plastics that have been exposed to bacteria, maybe even bacteria plates in there. You uh, wrap up this the, the bag with tape, put autoclave tape on it, autoclave it, cool it off, and then it can be thrown in the garbage. Notice even in this, these tubes, this rack of tubes, we put a little bit of autoclave tape on there. So we have indication that they have been sterilized. Um, again, anything with liquids should really be done in uh, an appropriate tub um, that is autoclave safe. So that way, if they do boil over, that liquid's contained within the tub, not into the autoclave. So it's worth repeating that, you know, this is all about getting time and temperature. The larger the volume, the longer it takes time to get to the final temperature, okay? So when you do something like this, you want to make sure you see this little cartoon down here. This is a cart that you might throw into the autoclave. On the top here, we have a whole bunch of containers. In this case, they would be plastic wrap container or paper wrap containers, but they're all right next to each other. So effectively, it's a huge single mass that takes longer for the internal parts of it to come up to heat. So by separating yourself so they're not separating your bottles and materials so they're not touching each other. So that way they're in the individual volumes or masses. All right. Um, I, it's also helpful if you're sterilizing or autoclaving bottles for later use to put a quarter mil or half a mil at the most of, of water in there that creates a steam inside that bottle. Uh, when you're unloading, wear the heat resistant gloves, allow that door to open up and cool off. Make sure that the conditions were met. You'll see the tape turn, open door slightly, let the steam wait, wait about five minutes. You'll see when the steam comes out. Don't open it up and jump in because you're in a hurry. You got to go to class. Um, you don't, you, you got your, your, your friends in the lab waiting for you. Take your time, slowly open the door. Keep your head and face out and reach in. If you've got lots of materials, we have a cart. You can move things in and out. Um, just really use really care so you don't have sharp movements. We talked about that before you set it down. You bang two um, bottles together with a bunch of LB or liquid in there. The liquid could bump out and then cause all sorts of boiling damage on your hands. All right, now centrifugation. So there's all sorts of things we're going to talk about here. The types of centrifugation, how far to fill your tubes, what kind of tubes to use, G-force, R-forces, R and things like this. So we're going to talk about all these things, including sign in. If you use the auto, if you use the centrifuge, you're going to sign in. Now, that does not talk about these tabletop centrifuges. We're really talking about the larger centrifuges. Um, and so there's a micro centrifuge. Um, you want to make sure we talk about balances for this, but you don't need to sign in for that. But the floor model and tabletop centrifuges that you can see here and here images of, you absolutely have to sign in for. Um, 
I'm going to show you an image here. Here are two of the, the centrifuges you'll find that you do need to sign in for. This would be the floor model, often called a super speed because of the RPMs that it can handle. And this is a tabletop or a low speed centrifuge. These centrifuges can have fixed angled rotors, where it's a metal rotor where the uh, angles of the tubes or the bottles stay fixed throughout the speed. You can have swinging bucket rotors where you put tubes or bottles inside a bucket that's on a pinion that would swing out as the rotor starts to turn. Both of these can have both. Here at USD, we only have a swinging bucket rotor in our Allegra, but they can be fit in other places when you move on with fixed angle rotors. So it's kind of rotors, bucket, swinging bucket rotor, or a fixed angle rotor can go in either kind, super speed, tabletop, or slow speed. So the principles of centrifugation, hello physics, pretty straightforward. Um, as your sample starts spinning, um, it creates a centrifugal force that creates a, um, enough velocity where, velocity where you're uh, creating um, a temporary increased gravitational force on these particles. You can pellet down more dense materials from materials that are in solution, proteins in solution generally, without adding um, high salts and things like this, are gonna stay in solution where a broken cell, let's say bacteria cell or a cell culture cell, the, the mitochondria, the cell membranes, the endoplasmic reticulum, the nuclei will all centrifuge down depending upon how long and how hard you centrifuge your tubes. So it's important when you're planning your experiment, when you're working with your faculty, when you're not putting in items or information into the centrifuge, RPM and G-force, which is a relative centrifugal force or RCF, they're not the same thing. So how fast you go, you need to mark down in your lab books. Um, did you, if you're going to use RPMs, the revolutions per minute, you need to make sure that you write RPMs and the rotor because these rotors have different um, diameters. So a uh, 1,000 RPMs at one rotor and then a thousand RPMs for another rotor that's much wider is going to have two different um, um, gravitational force applied to that. So RPM is not the same for rotor to rotor. So if you want an X um, relative centrifugal force or G force, that means you're going to change the RPMs depending upon the rotor. So work with your faculty to understand the difference. And there's a lot of nuances and where the g-force is at the top of a fixed angle rotor the middle or the bottom and averaging all that out the information is kind of put here if you're interested in that you can certainly do this so speeds for the tabletop are usually zero to about seven eight thousand rpms uh and on the on the um, um higher speed floor models you can get twenty thousand or above uh, we share with physics an ultra centrifuge we can do, which can do well over a thousand um, times G, so something like 80, 90 RPMs in a vacuum environment because the gas, the air molecules will actually cause friction and heat um, when you're spinning at 70,000 times around per minute, getting you around 100 or more um, thousand times the force of gravity. Okay. So, G force or RCF is not the same as RPM. If your protocol requires G and you start plugging in RPM, you're going to probably not have a successful experiment and you can damage the rotor and the centrifuge. So make sure you know which one is right. So tubes, if the tube doesn't fit perfectly, don't freaking use it. All right. I know that sounds kind of pushy here, but it's really important. If you look at a rotor and you can see that it's a rounded rotor, maybe it's got a shape that fits this, but it's wide enough to just perfectly fit this, but it doesn't have a um, the conical tube. Don't use a tube with a bottom that's round like this. And on the other half, if you see a tube that's wide enough to fit a round uh, tube like this, but it's conical, don't put a round bottle. It's got to fit not just the sides perfectly, but the bottom perfectly to support it or you have to get an insert. Because what happens if you spin this tube in a round bottom slot in a rotor, then this will warp the plastic, probably crack it, cause it to spin out, cause your rotor to come out of balance. And suddenly you have a broken washing machine that's running around with a big mass and thousands of RPMs. And the instrument will break. It could cause damage to it. It can cause damage to you. It can be well over um, $10,000. 
All right. So some of these tubes can only handle low RPMs or uh, G force. Polypropylene, polystyrene, and ultra tubes can change the amount of G force you can handle. So your average Falcon tubes, 15 or 50 um, tube, even if it's in the right um, uh, fitting or adapter um, for the uh, the conical end of this, your average tube can only handle a couple of uh, um, thousand G force. You have to have special tubes to handle six, seven, eight thousand times G. There are different what we call Oak Ridge or polysulfonyl or polycarbonate tubes. This would be a polycarbonate tube. This would be a, a um, polypropylene. You can see it's opaque. Um, they can handle much higher pressures or temper. Well, excuse me, uh, gravitational force. We also have big buckets that can handle up to a liter each. These are nice polypropylene. They need to be filled to a completely. If you don't fill these bottles up completely when spinning them, the void in this will cause um, uh, the, the tube to cave in on itself and eventually fade. You see these have special closers, make sure they have the O-rings on them. If you don't, you don't need to memorize all this, but you do need to understand using the right tube. One of the biggest errors we see that cause damage to the centrifuge, losing um, experiment time, and just overall frustration is people using a tube because it sort of fits or that's what somebody else told them. If it doesn't fit perfectly and it isn't the right tube for the RCF, don't do it. If you don't know, ask your PI. Don't ask another student, ask your PI. These centrifuges cost in excess of $80,000. You don't have the money to do it. Actually, most of your PIs don't either, but at least they're gonna be responsible. If you're not sure, ask, okay? Um, the last thing I want to talk about is look at your tubes. If they look like they're cracked, if they look like they're misshapen because they were misused, don't use them. All right. You want to fill these up to the shoulder, but no more than three quarters or so of the tube. You don't want to have tubes, and whether they're falcon tubes or not, where it's all the way filled because as you start spinning, these are at an angle and you're going to get spillage. That's going to cause not just a mess inside the centrifuge, but more importantly, you're going to unbalance that centrifuge. And if you start rolling around, you get a shift in the center of balance on that thing. You can literally break the spindle on this. So look at the tubes. Um, if they're small volumes, less than 25% filled, you will cause a deforming as those, as those tubes start spinning. Uh, if there's nothing on the top end of this tube, the plastic from the outside or the inside will literally bend out with that gravitational force causing cracking and malforming in those tubes. If you can't get the tube out, it's probably what you did. Don't overfill, okay? Um, if the tube doesn't fit, it will be loose. It will break because of mechanical issues. Stay within the G-force for each tube. This is not a table you need to worry about. Now, but if you're working with acids or bases or different kinds of uh, solvents, you got to make sure that your tube is resistant to that solvent. This is, this is um, less of biological materials, but with a lot of chemistry. So again, if you don't know, what's the answer? Ask your PI, ask your boss, ask the instructor, not the other students. Trust me, we've seen this. They don't usually know. All right. So another question is, how do you balance these things? You want to get these things balanced on the pan balance. So they're the same. If you don't pay attention, the little slider, the little balance slider on the bottom of that might not be where it's supposed to be. Meaning that make sure that with nothing on the pan balance, that the indicator is right in the middle. Somebody may have changed it before you. Don't trust that it's already in the right place. Stop, look, move it over to the left, make sure it's balanced beforehand. If you have tube holders to put your buckets in, then put the tube holders on there. Don't assume, even though if they look like they're the same, they're the same mass. You put them on the pan balance, you use that little, that mass slider to adjust to get the needle in the middle. You want to try to get your samples within about 0.1 gram or even less if you're doing them on a balance. All right. For fixed angle rotors like this, you want to make sure that the samples are directly mat balanced across from each other. So here in this larger version, um, this sample here and this sample here have to be balanced within 0.1 gram or less to each other. 
the bat tubes right next to each other don't have to balance, but across from each other do. This in this image is talking about it. Let's say you have five tubes, you create a balance tube with water or some other solution. So this tube balances out against here. Here's an example of a swingy bucket rotor where you're balancing it out. Here you notice that they're you're not trying to balance them out across. That way you want to balance them off straight across because this is the pin that the swinging bucket slide out on. So here's the correct way where you see across from each other, they're balanced here, across from each other, there's nothing. And that would be an imbalance. Within a fixed angle, spread them out, but make sure if you have three here, directly across, you have another one, two, three. Over here, one, two, three. Whereas here they have one, two, three, four. They only have one, two, three. They're five here. They have three here. This is not balanced when this gets swinging. You can almost tell that this thing's going to come off center. When changing rotors, the floor model rotor, if you look at the spindle, you'll see two little pins, these dry, okay? These pins are supposed to match in the, um, the drive pins in a rotor. So if you look either underneath the rotor or in from the top, you should see two or four pins coming out from the side. Those pins need to sit right in the drive assembly, either in between the fork or right down to the side. The worst thing you can do is have that drive pin sitting on the top of the drive pin assembly. So when the assembly spindle starts to turn, it'll drop down rotate and shear that thing off and bend the pin. Uh, I prefer that those drive pins are right within these two um, uh, slots for the drive pin assembly. Others, it can be on the side. If you're not sure, ask for help, okay? This is another big way that centrifuges get destroyed. This is kind of hard to show here. There's a video we have that you can look at for how to turn down and screw on the head. Some of the heads only have one screw tying the head to the cover of the rotor, okay? Uh, others, in this case, you have two threads. One thread locks the, the top and the rotor to the spindle where the top thread here ties the top of the of the rotor to the rotor itself. This picks up and down. And the second knob underneath here is called the daisy knob. So you wanna make sure, and we have folks that will take sure and make sure we have spin coat on the O-rings and the threads themselves. You wanna make sure you look at this each time to make sure that these things aren't stripped because somebody put them in there and manhandled them and, and put them in cockeyed and caused the metal to strip out try to put it in there, you could actually get it stuck on yourself. If you see that, even if you're right in the middle of a big experiment, contact the PI, contact uh, Sharon Ferguson, um, our technic one of the technicians that works here, um, and get some help with that. Look at the threads to start with, right? Make sure they're not stripped. So you want to hold that top tie down knob up and use a daisy knob to tie the the top here to the rotor. So you're really turning this first thread set here that's closest to the to the actual cover by turning this. You hold this up, turn this. Then you use this to turn this to tie into the spindle. I know it's kind of complicated, but it's important that you do the top to the rotor, then the whole rotor to the spindle, okay? Daisy knob, tie now knob. You have to hold the tie, knob, tie down knob up when you're turning the daisy knob. There's a video we have on this. Take a look. Get a hand. Cleaning. Okay. Um, if you scratch a rotor with a brush or a wire brush or something or something that's a little bit abusive, let's say a, a scotch pad or something to get off a tough stain, you're going to cause um, a, the, the coating, the covering um, on the rotor to get um, scratched in that set up for um, a rust spot, it'll cause for failure of the rotor over time. Um, so you wanna make sure that when you're done with this, if there's any spill, you rinse it out with the water, give it a last rinse with DI water, use a soft cloth to spill up those spills inside the rotor. Same thing in the centrifuge itself. If you've got a spill in there, the side, clean it up. Uh, use non-corrosive detergents 
Um, and you don't soak the rotor if it's really nasty. You just keep cleaning it off. Why do I keep talking about talk to your PI? This thing you can see is this is the inside of a, a super speed um, centrifuge where there was an imbalance. It caused the spindle to break. And inside, like a spinning top, is a bomb ready to blow up. And you can see it's armored with this metal here. And the uh, metal is just sheared. Same thing happened here where even the sides fell off, for God's sakes. And here you can see that metal armor was just broken up in small pieces. It doesn't take much, right? So that's why it's important to sign in so we know who used it. It's broke, tell somebody. If you broke it, tell somebody. Uh, don't walk away. If you're not sure, ask your PI. If you haven't been trained by a faculty or a staff, you haven't been trained. If another student or postdoc told you how to do it, you haven't been trained. Your PIs and technicians do the training, not other students, not graduate students or postdocs, period. When you're done with the centrifuge at the end of the day, you can shut off the centrifuge, but you leave it open so that way it dries out. If you shut it and sh shut the centrifuge and shut it off, you get all sorts of nasty crap growing inside. Okay, so um, compressed air, CO2 tanks, nitrogen gas tanks, air tanks, oh, we use these all the time. Using these are very important. Um, if you move these things around without using the cart, you'll you could easily cause the tank to tip and this thing becomes a missile. It does happen. If, these, if the, uh, CO, uh, the compressed cylinders aren't controlled by a strap or a, a chain to the bench or to the wall, this could happen. And this is not actually a cart. I mean, it's a cartoon. It's not funny because these things actually help happen. You have to use a trolley or cart to move things. You don't want to do any more than just typical, simple little movements within just tiny bits without using a cart. Okay. Um, work with the chemistry biochemistry staff to move in empty tanks. You don't know how ask. This is what safety is. Ask. We're happy to help you. We don't want you to do something where you cause yourself or, or anybody else any damage. Um, a lot of people don't know how to use regulators. If you look at here as a two-stage regulator up here, this valve is going to open and close the first valve to the atmosphere, right? And so these are a two-stage um, regulator. This would be a one stage where you only have one controller here, you open it up and it's a one stage controlling the gas flow out. This is a two stage. This is mostly what we use, especially for CO2, O2, um, um, nitrogen gas tanks, all right? The important other part of this is a, a regulator for a CO2 tank is not gonna be the same regulator for a nitrogen tank or an oxygen tank. They each different um, requirements and different fittings. So make sure you match the regulator to the gas for that regulator to the kind of tank it's using. Sometimes there are multiple gases, but it's not any regulator on any type of gas tank. So how do you read these things? So, and here's a typical first one. If you look again, let's say this kind of um, regulator is very much like the regulator up here at the top left. This first um, valve is literally just opening up all the gases at whatever pressure is inside the tank to the regulator. And then we have this two-stage regulator. So the gases are coming out here. And then you have this gauge. This first gauge is literally reading the pressure coming from, excuse me, from the tank. So this will tell you the gas pressure inside the tank. This will open up and close to change the pressure that's coming out to the atmosphere. This is the pressure that's coming out of this end. This valve can change the rate of the gases going out. This, and it can impact the pressure overall. This is how you set and adjust the pressure. So you got the needle control valve. You've got the working pressure gauge from this first screw. In this case, it's a big um, black knob here. It's just a brass handle, a T handle. Again, from the tank pressure out after the tank pressure. Okay, this means if you're using a CO2 incubator or an instrument, you got to know the pressure that that instrument can handle, and you set this here. This just tells you how much gas is left. If you watch this one, it should stay pretty steady until almost the gas is gone. How much gas is in the tank, 
how much gas pressure is coming out. Pretty simple. To change this, you want to make sure there's no pressure on either one of these because you close the main tank and open this up and let the gas pressure out. If you have any pressure from because the tank valve is open or you haven't released the pressure out here, you're never going to get this unscrewed. Then you're going to want to unscrew this with a crescent wrench or a, a fixed wrench and make sure that you have the O-rings on when you put it back on, the Teflon ring, um, the Teflon washer. Another hazard we deal with all the time in chemistry and biochemistry, uh, molecular biology is dealing with molten agar or agarose, whether it's heating them in the microwave, heating them in an autoclave, or heating them on a, on a hot plate. Um, this has a real potential to cause somebody damage. When you're heating agar or agarose in, let's say, a microwave, it's important that you put it in there while you're wearing uh, PPE gloves that are insulated um, and hopefully gloves that are insulated for liquid to not seep and penetrate through the glove too. A lightweight glove is not going to work well. Um, you want to wear glass or safety shield and you want to wear a full um, sleeved lab coat. So if this does spill over on you, you're limiting the damage to your body, to your skin. So oftentimes you're going to have to put agar, agarose into the microwave. And there's no way to know the shape of the bottle, the mass that you put in there, and the strength of the uh, the autoclave or the, the microwave is not standard. So even if you have a protocol that says two minutes, don't trust it. Even if you've done it a hundred times, don't trust it. You put on your sample in there in the microwave, you put close it, put it on 30 seconds, a minute if you've got a couple hundred mils, if you've got four or 500 mils, maybe a couple more minutes, and you go around and you take a watch. And when it's done, you open it up and you very carefully with gloves on, with heat resistant gloves on, maybe even a paper towel to keep um, some spill resistance, you pick it up and slosh it around a little bit. If it's really hot, let it sit. If it's not completely molten, Close it down and put it on for another minute or so. Open it up, turn it on for another minute or so. Don't try to do it all at once because if you set it for five or six minutes and it really only needed three or four, you come back, you're going to have agar everywhere. It can be superheated. You pick it up, it will boil over your hands. Okay. So it's important you wear a heat resistant glove, uh, preferably like a silicon tile. I really don't like this image very much. I chose it because it shows maybe the wrong kind, these kind of gloves. And heat resistant, but man, if you put hot water or hot agar on there, the liquid would go straight through that hand or the glove onto your hand. Okay. These super gases will bump out really easy if you're not, the superheated gases are going to bump out really easy if you're not careful. Um, it's important to use a much larger container than the volume. You want to use something that's two or three, maybe even four times of a volume of a container than you have of the liquid. So that way, as the boiling and bumping occurs, it doesn't spill over. So putting a 500 mils in a 500 mil bottle and trying to microwave or autoclave or put it on a hot plate is just asking for losing samples, causing a waste, causing a mess, and even damaging and hurting your skin with that, okay? Uh, if you have it totally open like a beaker, use a paper towel or, or something um, to limit the spill. Microwave one flask at a time. You can tell when agar, it's totally um, dissolved or molten because it will be um, clear, translucent versus particles still floating around. Here's an example of agarose um, that is not fully molten. And here you can see it's fully melted and in solution because it's now it's translucent, it's not opaque, right? This still has unmolten, unmelted particles of agarose or agar in this case. It's molten, it's clear, you're good to go. Wear heat resistant silicon gloves. Sonicator, we use sonicators all the time to bust open cells. It's high speed uh, or a high energy ultrasound waves that cause overpressures and change gases to come in and out of solution, vibrates um, um, the membranes apart and causes the cells to break. It can cause shearing of DNA, even um, degas solvents without using a vacuum. Um, the high pressure sound or high Frequency sounds can cause your ears damage. If you have hearing aids, it can ruin your hearing aids. Um, the energy in the sound waves can actually bother folks if they have um, um, heart implants or medical devices. So you want to be careful. 
At USD, we just purchased a sound booth container, but you still want to wear hearing protection and be careful about using that um, and make sure that everything's shut and tight. It's always good to be more safe than maybe you need. So work with your PI to learn how much and how uh, long to sonicate your samples. Too high of a sample will cause what's called cavitation, which means all the gases in the solution come out as foam and you're no longer sending energy through the probe into the solution. And you know, wait a bit, the gases, the foam will dissipate and then you can do it again with the lower energy. The deeper the probe, the different energies you can use, a tip right at the top of a solution. Um, it doesn't take much energy to cause that decavitation, foaming and spitting them out. So you wanna put that tip about halfway or more into there. You never wanna run the sonicator with um, the sonicator not is submerged because then the energy goes back up into the transponder and can ruin this thing. They're, they're several thousand dollars each. You also don't want to touch the probe to the plastic. Again, that'll cause problems with the plastic, cause the glass to break, and can ruin the sonicator tip. For the love of God, never touch the sonicator with your hands or any of your, any of your body parts. Uh, it will literally disrupt those cells. They use these kind of sonicators, at least they used to, to sculpt bodies when doing liposuctions. It would disrupt and destroy the cells like a laser wand going through fat tissue. Um, if you touch it while it's on, it's going to do the same thing to them. So don't touch the sides. Don't run it with it not in solution. Don't touch it with your hand. And make sure it's submerged enough where it doesn't capitate. If it does, shut off the power, let your sample set, and go again hearing protection, even with the box. Be extra careful. We often use UV transluminators or UV light to sterilize um, or visualize certain things. So this is a UV transluminator. It'll put out UV light. Uh, we have, of course, UVA, UVB, and UVC, depending upon the wavelength. Um, there's lots of problems associated with being exposed to UV light, causes DNA to crosslink, and then you get all sorts of misreads and potential cancers cancers to happen. Uh, long, too long of an exposure, even just a few minutes, even just a minute of your eyes to this UV light, especially for transluminator, can cause enough inflammation where the tissues will swell around the optic nerve, causing temporary blindness. I have seen this uh, with a medical student who did not wear glasses when they were doing their DNA gels, and they had done several gels in a row, and the next two or three days, he had to have... Um, gauze packed on his eyes because he had lost sight because of the damage to the cells caused all this inflammation and literally uh, squeezed off the optic nerve. So it was really bad. You can also, um, if you're wearing with just goggles, but leaning over and leaving it on for very long at all, let a minute or so, you can cause um, sun damage to your skin and it'll look like you were in the sun with a pair of glasses or something. You look like a raccoon, uh, but that's causing damage to your skin much, much faster, much more uh, intensely than you would if you're out in the San Diego sun. So these transluminators are used to look at nucleic acids and gels and other things for ethidium bromide and other uh, fluorescent dyes. Uh, make sure that you limit your time. You wear a full sheet with, shield with the UV protection on it. Wear gloves. Minimize the time. Minimize the time you've got the power on. Uh, we have handheld units. We sometimes use this to um, sterilize areas maybe that you're working at minimize the time that that UV light is focused on you or your hand or your skin. In, in the biosafety hoods for doing cell culture, you have germicidal lamps. They're, they're usually not able to be put on because there's a trigger. If the glass in front is open, but if it does happen to open, don't put that on. Uh, these germicidal labs or um, lights will use the UV light, damage the DNA and RNA in the cells, causing those cells to die can cause the same problems for you. Okay. Uh, heat blocks happens all the time. You hear about this in Gen Chem safety. Um, same thing applies here. Make sure you put it on when it's appropriate, off when it's not. Uh, lots and lots of cases of somebody turning it on. The heat, instead of the stir, walking away, everything melts. You get electrical fires because the solution or the heat destroys the, the container, the plastic or something, off it goes. So make sure you use the right uh, materials and that it's um, maintained and watch, especially for stirring hot plates. Um, it can happen, a postdoc at Penn State in 21 uh, was using a heat stir plate to stir a Western blot in a cold room, came back, the reservoir melted, liquid caught in, you got an electrical fire, on, turned a big fire throughout the lab. 
in January 26, a graduate student it, um, reported that her hot plate unexpectedly heated really high temperature when she wasn't around. Um, when the temperature was monitored by a thermocouple probe and it caused a pretty big fire, um, it was quickly extinguished, but these things aren't rare, but you just got to pay real close attention. So what do we do with things like ethylene bromide waste, uh, ethanol waste, methanol waste uh, from Bradford and stuff? Ask your instructor, ethylene bromide and methanol. We have containers in the biochem lab specifically for that. You can see here Bradford waste with it's got methanol container right here. Same kind of waste containers we've been using in all of our classes. This should be familiar. We've got ethylene bromide. We often try to use a different um, safe biosafe dye instead of uh, thinning bromide, but if you do end up using it, it'll be a waste container in the lab hood. Um, if you're doing cell culture, if you're doing aspirations, it's important that you have a, a two-step aspirator. One uh, where the solution goes directly into this catch flask. You put bleach at the bottom, a little bit of bleach in the bottom, about um, nine to one ratio here, 10 to one ratio. Um, um, fill The solution goes in here and then the gas has come out the top. This is how you're gonna make sure that whatever you're aspirating out of your sample, maybe it's uh, tissue cell culture or some other thing um, will then be um, neutralized and sterilized, okay? Uh, for bacteria strains, most of the strains we use are K12, DH5-alpha, SBL21s. Um, these are considered low risk or risk group one agents. They're not associated with the disease. Even if you put, for whatever reason, that bacteria back in your body, um, we don't have to worry about biosafety one contaminants. How do we get rid of E. coli? The liquid, you can add 10% bleach, let it sit for a few minutes, 30 minutes, and then dump it down the drain and fall it with a little bit more bleach and plenty of water. Solid waste like pellets and things such as petri dishes, loops, um, centrifuge tubes that need to be disposed of. We have uh, either clear or orange biohazard bags that can are autoclavable. We'll autoclave them up, sterilize, and then we can get rid of them. Surfaces, 70% ethanol or 10% bleach. Wash them after you're done, minimally each week after, or, or when you're done with the spill. Wearing PPE again, so you don't contaminate materials when materials don't contaminate you, gloves, goggles, and of course, a lab coat. Sharps. This is a repeat from what you've seen in other labs. Sharps are in, of course, needles. We use a lot of needles in biochemistry in different ways. We Each lab has a sharps container. Don't go beyond the full point. If it is full, contact your PI, your, your instructor, to make sure you get another one. Don't overfill the sharps container. Each container has to have a start date and a generator label for it to be used. Um, glass, broken glass, pipette, glass pipettes and stuff goes in a, in a container. Every space has one of these. They, the broken glass and things do not go in sharps. Sharps are for needles, um, scalpels, razor blades, things like this. Glass goes in the broken glass. Don't use the two inter intermittently. Don't put needles in here. Don't put broken glass in there. It's a waste of space because we have to use a, uh, a catalyzed um, solution to, to make this into a solid to be able to dis discard it. Um, 70 degree or eight minus 80 degree incubator or uh, freezer. I'm going to just bring this up here. If you're using minus 80 degrees, limit the time you're in there. Don't take stuff out, set it aside and go inside. Uh, it's a pain, but you also don't want to leave it open. This is not a grocery or a um, your refrigerator where you're looking for what to eat for the day. Know what you're looking for. Go in there, find it, get in and, and shut the door. I show these two things because this is also a place where we get lots of problems. Um, make sure the, the, the doorknob is not only in the up close position, but then use the lock to make sure the little latch inside doesn't allow the door to push the latch out. So every time you Go to open up this, use the key to unlock it, open it, close it, put the latch up, close the key, and make sure that can't pop back open. If you can unlock it, then you didn't set the key properly. Here's an example of our other minus 80 where you use the key to pop up this post here. And when that post is all the way up, you can't move that latch up or down. So make sure that thing is locked when you're done because you, even if you put the latch in the up, right position if that key isn't fully engaged and that post isn't stopping the latch from coming down. It doesn't take much 
uh, for ice expansion or something, or somebody bump into the door for that thing to pop down and open up and lose tens of thousands of dollars worth of materials. All right. Um, if you hear beeps and buzzes, warnings, tell your PI. Even if you think they already know, tell him or her what's going on. Tell your instructor, all right? Incubators, check temps, check gas tanks, work with your PI, work with your instructor to make sure the incubators are functioning properly. If you use a CO2 incubator for cell culture, learn how to use that with your PI. And lastly, you want to be a good etiquette. You don't want to be SpongeBob or you certainly don't want to be Patrick here. Um, you want to be uh, respectful of your lab members. And, and that means all sorts of things, not just socially, but give advice when asked. If you don't know, say, I don't know and ask. Be safety minded. Know when to talk and when not to visit. There's times where chatter is going to cause either safe issues or it's going to ruin your experiment. So sometimes being respectful is being quiet. Uh, make sure your space is clean, replace chemicals, refill and remake buffers. Don't leave empty or nearly empty solution for others. If you've got a buffer or water container to fill, take care of it. Put a note on coming back. I'll take care of it a little bit. Let them to have know for however you do your communications. Hey, we're almost out of PBS buffer. I'm going to come in tonight and make some or whatever that is. This is really important. It's really, it's really easy to say, oh, we're out of sodium chloride. I'm just going to go next door and grab some. I'll give it back later on. Don't just do that. Don't go into the biochem and, and steal stuff. Talk to your mentor before ever using material from another lab or the stockroom. Keep a good lab book. That's about safety. Label all solutions and samples with what's in that, your name and the date it was made, whether it's in the freezer, on the bench, or in the cold room. Don't hoard resources. Um, the fridge, freezer, bench top is not long-term storage. Toss when done. And when all else is done, be respectful for lab members, both personally, socially, as well as just being a good lab citizen. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we appreciate your time.